Okay. Uh, welcome to the last session of the conference. Um, I'm surprised there's this many people in the room, so hope it, hopefully I can live up to the expectations. Um, this presentation is Just Buzz or Real Byte, uh, eBPF and Cloud Native. Um, if you don't know me, I'm Bill Mulligan. I'm a community pollinator at Isovalent. Uh, I say pollinator because eBPF, we like to talk about bees, and I help communities grow and flourish, especially around eBPF and Cilium. So with that, um, so who recognizes like this logo right now, like Intel Inside, right? And when you see this logo, you think of like, da -da -da -da, right, Intel Inside. And this is a great marketing thing, but how many people actually understood what the technology meant, right? So when you're giving somebody a laptop and you say, oh, there's Intel Inside, how many people actually understand that? Not that many. But because it's a brand and people think that Intel Inside makes it better, people want to buy that, right? So it's not about the technology, but it's about what they think the technology will do for them. And I would actually argue that eBPF is quite similar, right? It's something you're going to want because of what it enables, what it allows you to do, what it's giving to your technology, but you don't necessarily have to understand or care about what's underneath the covers. This session will give you like a brief introduction into what eBPF is and some of those advantages it will bring, but you're not going to be have to writing code to take advantage of, the, of those benefits, right? So just like you don't need to know exactly how the hardware works to get the benefits of Intel inside, having eBPF inside will allow you to do things like faster networking or low, over observabil uh, low overhead observability but you get all those benefits without having to understand all the technology. Hopefully after this presentation, you'll understand a little bit uh, what's going on, and that's kind of the goal of this. So to kind of like set the stage of where eBPF was coming from, there's kind of this paradox between kernel space and user space. So if you're in the Linux kernel, you have complete system awareness because you're basically um, have the interface between the software and the actual hardware. But because of this, um, it kind of like lacks the flexibility, right? It's a very important thing. The Linux kernel is deployed on billions of devices worldwide. Um, it kind of has a like slow innovation cycle and it doesn't really have the flexibility of user space, right? And it, in user space, it's extremely programmable. Um, it's where we do all of our things but it doesn't actually have access to those kernel structures or resources. Um, and so in user space, you have this flexibility. In kernel space, you have you know, performance and visibility, but you don't really have kind of like both of them anywhere. And there was, or I guess there is kernel modules, but they come with their own set of problems where they're difficult to code, they have the potential to crash the kernel, um, and they're not always stable, which obviously you don't want if you're running a mission critical system. So how can we kind of overcome this challenge and get the best out of both? Can we enable programmability in the kernel and how will this benefit the cloud native world? And that's where eBPF comes along. So what is eBPF? eBPF at an extremely high level makes the Linux kernel and actually a lot of um, kernel systems programmable. It's beyond just Linux now, um, but it helps provide that flexibility in, kernel, in the kernel. And what it does is it makes it programmable in both a secure and efficient way. And I'll dive into kind of like each of these aspects later on, but I think that's like the next thing. So one example that uh, was kind of popular, popularized to explain what eBPF is doing is that uh, what the JavaScript is to the browser, eBPF is to the Linux kernel, right? So if you think about before JavaScript uh, came to the internet, you had these static web pages where you're essentially just consuming information off of them. But once we had JavaScript, suddenly we had an interactive environment. You could have things you, that you could click on. You had forms that you could submit, right? All of a sudden, these pages came to life, and you were able to interact with it. And that's exactly what eBPF is doing to the Linux kernel, too. It's making it interactive. It's making it programmable so we can use it in new and interesting ways that we couldn't do before. 
and so uh, this quote from Linus, who uh, obviously started Linux, is like BPF has actually been really useful, and the real power of it is it allows people to do specialized code that isn't enabled until it's asked for, right? It's this programmability aspect. And what it allows you to do is to dynamically, at runtime, change the kernel behavior. And so this is a nice uh, kind of uh, cartoon of what it's like, this paradox I was talking about before, between uh, kernel space and user space, before we had eBPF, what it'd be like. So an application developer is going along, and they want to do, have a new feature to observe their application. So they go and talk to their friendly kernel developer, uh, and he said, hey, I don't want to get involved in Linux kernel mailing lists. Uh, would you be able to add this feature to the Linux kernel for me? And the de developer is like, sure. It's just going to take a year to convince everybody in the community that it's a good idea. And one year later, you finally have it merged into the upstream kernel. And it's like, great. But then you actually need it co to come from the upstream latest kernel to the one you're actually running in production, which for some people, maybe five years later. So you're looking at a six year development cycle to get your new feature into the kernel and to have it into production. And by that time, uh, it, if you know anything about technology, everything has changed, right? And so this isn't a very good way to get new features and functionality that you need into like the Linux kernel. But now with eBPF, because we can dynamically add new functionality right at runtime, your application developer can say, hey, I want this new feature to observe my application. And the eBPF developer can say, hey, no problem. Like, let me just quickly solve this with eBPF. And a couple days later, they can add the program into their running kernel system. It will uh, anatomically add it, and you don't even have to re reboot your machine. Suddenly you have a completely new functionality added into your system running in production, and you can have it um, almost immediately. And that's really what the power of eBPF is. It's shortening this innovation cycle on the Linux um, kernel, which is a 30-year-old technology, and bringing it forward into the cloud native world into a faster pace of technological change. So eBPF programs, uh, what they do, um, when we were saying um, that, that they're running, so they're running on events. So they hook into different points within the kernel, um, things like K probes or U probes, system calls, and when that um, is invoked, then the eBPF program runs. So it's watching everything that's happening, and then it's running a specific program based off of those triggers in the kernel. And that's kind of like the whole idea behind eBPF. And as Brendan Gregg likes to say, this really gives you superpowers uh, to Linux because it allows you to add new functionality at any point in the kernel uh, whenever you want to. Um, right, and so the Linux kernel, as I was saying before, is a very important system, right, because it's controlling this interface between software and hardware. And so you don't really want to mess it up. Uh, like causing your kernel to crash or panic is really bad. So the important part is it's also safe and performant changes to kernel behavior. You're not just changing it as you want. You want to be able to do it in a safe and efficient manner too. And so eBPF kind of uh, knew that and so built things in around that too. So th the first and probably like most important thing is like the safety. So before your eBPF program can be loaded into the kernel, it actually has to pass through the eBPF verifier. Um, and basically the verifier checks that the programs will run all the way to completion, they won't make the kernel hang, uh, they won't crash or like harm the system in a way that is kind of like irre irrecoverable. And so the verifier helps make sure that your programs aren't going to harm the kernel or harm your whole kind of like infrastructure. Uh, the second part um, that is really important for a lot of people is the performance, right? If you're running something in the kernel, you want it to be very performant. And so it, what eBPF does is it takes kind of like the bytecode of these programs and compiles it into machine-specific uh, machine construct, instruction set. Um, and you're running it in the kernel, so these programs basically run as efficiently as natively compiled uh, Linux kernel code. So instead of um, having to like r run something in user space, you can now run it directly in the kernel. And so 
that speeds up a lot of things and also you're saving the cost of having to switch the context from user space into kernel space and back again. And so you get a lot of performance benefits out of EVPF2. Now, uh, you're not just making user space go away um, with EVPF, so you still need to interact with it. And so EVPF also has the concept of maps. And so essentially what these are is shared memory that between user space and kernel space where they can pass information back and forth between them. So as your EVPF program is running, say, observability and collecting information on events that are happening in, in the kernel, it can then pass those um, like events into user space for processing, for saving, for whatever you want to do. And so the great thing about maps is they, they, they aren't losing data and they're, they're more performant too. So that's like the extremely <laughs> brief overview of eBPF. Um, obviously there's a lot more if you really want to dive into it. But now I guess this is um, a cloud native conference. So how does eBPF and all of this relate to cloud native? Right, and so when we're thinking about like what cloud native is, is it's kind of bringing all these resources into um, uh, running on a single host, right? We're running lots of containers on a single host. And so when we're talking about eBPF, right, it's these multiple different applications are all uh, connecting from user space down into kernel space. Uh, things like running processes, reading files, or making a network call. And it's all doing it on the same host. And the kernel is aware of everything that's happening on that host, right? Everything that needs to happen needs to go through the kernel. And all of these pods that are running are all um, accessing everything through the same kernel. Right, and this is what's cool about eBPF, right? So since everything's going into a shared kernel, if you put an eBPF program on this host, it can see everything that's happening. It has complete context of everything that's happening in your Kubernetes cluster. It's not gonna be missing anything because everything has to go through the kernel to do that, right? So if you're using something like a, a sidecar in user space, it's only connected to a single pod, right? And if you, I don't know, a malicious actor comes in and starts spinning up pods that are outside your cluster, or sorry, containers that are like outside your cluster, it's not a, your, a, a lot of user space things are gonna miss that, but since everything is going through the kernel, eBPF has complete visibility over that. And the other thing is you don't need to do any changes to your code and configuration because it's running in kernel space. Anything that's calling into kernel space will be seen by eBPF. So it's like kind of no instrumentation, which is a really big benefit too. So what eBPF does by moving into kernel space is it allows you to like kind of use the all the benefits around performance and visibility that the Linux kernel has, but now finally add in that flexibility aspect and speed up the innovation cycle and make eBPF ready for the cloud native world. So it provides safety, performance, observability, programmability into this 30 year old technology. And the great thing is now it, eBPF is available on most kernels that people are running in production. So let's dive into some of the cloud native use cases that we have. So the first one um, is networking. So eBPF is actually from a packet filtering background. Um, uh, and it's not just for networking anyway, but this is what, like really the roots of the technology. And the two like big projects around that um, are Cilium and Hubble. And this is providing high performance uh, networking based on eBPF. Uh, we're seeing other projects start to like pick up um, networking or networking with eBPF too, and it's great to see that innovation happening. The second really big use case um, is around observability, right? So eBPF has complete context and visibility into everything that's happening on the host, and so you can see uh, understand what all of your applications are doing, or even the applications that aren't yours that are running on the host. So there's different projects like um, Inspector Gadget, um, Hubble for network visibility, um, Open Telemetry, just add an eBPF collector, Packet, where are you for debugging um, network traces, and al also Pixie. So if you want to check out like how eBPF is related to observability, I would check out some of these projects. Um, the next big area is around security. Uh, I, I think this is a really rising use case. Um, I think 
knowing kind of like the ecosystem, the most use cases, or the most projects I've seen so far have been around networking and a lot around observability. And I think we're really starting to see the innovation happening around security right now too, right? And so the reason why that is, is because I, I think a little bit based off of the observ observability piece where you're able to observe everything that's happening on your system, right? And that's how you secure a system is you need to know what's going on. Otherwise you have a bunch of unknown unknowns, right? And so with eBPF, you're able to understand what's happening on the whole host. And based off of that, you can secure your systems. So we're seeing a lot of interesting projects that you can create security profiles based off of what you know that's happening uh, from eBPF programs. And you can also do things like runtime enforcement. So say there's a malicious um, program or actor on your machine, and you can see it based on uh, the, the profile you're collecting, then eBPF, since it's running in the kernel, can uh, kill that process or, or stop it. So I think security is a very big space to watch um, in the next couple of years around uh, for eBPF. And then the last big area is in uh, profiling and tracing. Um, so being able to track everything that's happening and how perform or how applications are working, you can basically track everything that is doing on the system and through that understand exactly how the application is performing or also isn't performing and optimize that. So there's a lot of um, projects that are doing continuous profiling like Py uh, Parka, Pyroscope, and Pixie that enable you to understand the performance characteristics um, of your application and also improve them. Um, I thought one really cool collaboration that uh, happened is the Parker project actually profiled Cilium and they were able to um, reduce our like um, memory overhead by like 30%. Um, so it was, it's, it's quite cool to see kind of the benefits that you can have from that. And it's not just about the projects. Like I said, I'm a community pollinator, so let's talk a little bit about the community. What's happening in the eBPF space right now? Um, there's, uh, if you go to eBPF.io, um, there's a landscape of all the different projects that are happening. So I wasn't able to kind of like dive into every single project in this short presentation. It's just a, a brief overview of the use cases, but there's lots of projects happening um, in the eBPF ecosystem. So these are like the major applications, as we like to say, but there's even more emerging ones. Um, I know in Cloud Native, we like to joke about the CNCF landscape. eBPF isn't quite there yet, but I think it's well on the trajectory to get to somewhere because I'm adding projects to this landscape all the time in a lot of new and interesting use cases too. Besides just like the applications, there's a lot happening on the infrastructure side. So obviously like the Linux kernel, different compilers for your eBPF programs um, and different libraries to load and unload um, uh, eBPF programs into and out of the kernel too. So if you're interested in the actually like coding of the programs, I would check out um, some of these projects. The kernel community, um, eBPF is actually one of the fastest growing subsystem in the Linux kernel mailing list. Um, this is actually the original email um, of submitting the patch set to first um, merge eBPF in. Um, Daniel Borkman, who is one of my colleagues at Isovalent, is super nice and he's one of the co-maintainers with some people at Meta too. Um, and there's a lot of active, de active development in the kernel community. In terms of like the market perspective and the acquisitions, um, so we're seeing kind of acquisitions across all these different use cases um, from security, observability, like uh, profiling. So and I think we're going to see this pick up more and more as more companies are both leveraging eBPF in their products and like larger companies that want to uh, innovate more too. There's also, as I was saying before, it's not just about Linux anymore. It's uh, eBPF can be running in a lot of different contexts. Uh, eBPF is actually being ported to Windows right now, and they're actually also working on standardizing the eBPF instruction set in the IETF. Um, so the, the discussions are just beginning for that too right now. However, it's not just a magic bullet. I don't want to say it's like all like sunshine, rainbows, fairy tales. Um, Obviously, no technology is perfect, right? So it's 
eBPF is just a technology. There's things that it's good at, there's things that it aren't bad at, and it's not applicable to every single use case. So a lot of the, I guess, quote unquote, like eBPF projects, um, like could be done with more simple technologies, right? It's the same thing, like not everything needs to run on Kubernetes. There's different technologies for different use cases. And when you're thinking, don't think everything has to be in eBPF, just like not everything has to run on Kubernetes, but there's a lot of great reasons to do it. So if you're looking at eBPF projects or eBPF technologies, look at the outcome rather than the technology. I think the technology you're gonna be seeing a lot, driving a lot of the use cases coming up in cloud native will be eBPF. But, and, but that's because of the benefits that it brings rather than kind of uh, the underlying technology itself. Like, I don't think you should think of eBPF as a checkbox, right? There's right ways to do it and the wrong ways to do it, just like any other technology. So if this got you a little bit interested in eBPF, um, where should you go next? Uh, one is uh, Wikipedia, right? Uh, the, the favorite source of the internet. Um, uh, the eBPF uh, Wikipedia page recently got added and it gives a nice overview of it. Uh, there's also, as I mentioned before, eBPF.io. Uh, that's where you can find the project landscape and also a little bit more in-depth uh, overview of what eBPF actually is if you want to dive in more. And that also provides you links to resources for further reading and further learning. Um, eBPF.io is also being translated into different languages. Um, so you can see the French translation right here. And I'm actually looking for help right now for translating the website into Chinese. So if you're interested in helping out and learning about eBPF and getting a jump start to contributing to the ecosystem, come talk to me. I'd love to um, see you help translate the website into Chinese. There's also labs to get started. So if you want to learn a little bit more about programming, eBPF labs, um, there's labs on the eBPF website. And there's also um, actually four years now of EBP e eBPF Summit. All the videos are on YouTube. Um, lots of great talks uh, from lots of different speakers uh, seeing how their company or their project or their technology is benefiting from eBPF. Uh, shameless self-promotion, I also run an eBPF newsletter that goes out bi-weekly. Uh, you can sign up on the website. And this is actually not publicly released yet. Um, so you, because you're here today, you get a little bit of a sneak preview. But we're actually going to be doing a documentary on eBPF. And it's going to be launching at KubeCon, Cloud Native Con in Chicago. Um, the actual trailer for it is going to be launching on Monday, so you get a couple days early just because you're in this room right now. Um, I've seen the trailer. It's pretty awesome. <laughs> Very biased, um, but I think it'll be really cool. And I, I think the story behind eBPF is really compelling, too. Uh, at KubeCon, I'll also be doing an illustrated children's guide to eBPF. If you saw the one for Kubernetes, it'll be uh, very similar. Um, I'm excited about this because uh, I'm writing this with one of my coworkers. Yeah, um, so those are some of the resources of where to go next. So I guess to kind of like wrap the whole presentation up, I'll bring it back to where we were at the beginning. So this whole vision for eBPF inside, right? We want new technologies not because of like what they are fundamentally, but because of what they enable, right? People wanted Intel inside because it, it, they thought it would give them a better computer, something that would, able to, that would be able to allow them to do more things with it, you know, have a better system, a more performance system, a more scalable system, whatever it is. And I think that's where we're gonna see eBPF going. It's gonna be the technology inside of a lot of projects, a lot of technologies, a lot of companies that's really driving the next wave of innovation in cloud native, and not because it's the, of the underlying technology. eBPF isn't just a marketing thing, right? I didn't say it's a silver bullet for every single solution, but it does provide a lot of benefits. It provides this programmability, the safety, these performance benefits. And because of that, people will be leveraging it in their applications because of what it enables. I guess a, a similar thing is, like, when you're thinking about your, like, mobile phone, right? So before we had smartphones, you just had whatever software came on the actual app uh, on the phone, whatever the manufacturer told you, this is what you're gonna need, right? But then when Apple came out with the, uh, um, the, the iPhone, right, suddenly you had an application store where you could decide 
what uh, applications were useful for you to have on your phone. Right, so as I came here to KubeCon China, right, I downloaded uh, Alipay so that I was able to pay people here, right? And I could make a decision about what things were. And I think that's the great thing about eBPF is allowing us to add new functionality to a decades old technology, allowing us to do a lot of interesting things. And I think people love uh, their uh, smartphones because it's able to let them do new things that they weren't able to do before by choosing what software is on it, right? I think that's what eBPF is unlocking in the cloud native ecosystem and was why it's going to be so important going forwards. So thank you uh, for coming today. Uh, if you want to check out more, uh, go to eBPF.io, uh, connect with me on Twitter, um, and we also have two books, What is eBPF and Learning eBPF, available for download on the iSavalent website. And with that, I think I have a couple minutes for questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for a great talk. So uh, I have just a very simple question. So uh, you, on some slide, you said that this program, uh, the bytecode for, for the eBPF is uh, first verified and then it's compiled or uh, I'm just wondering like how it differs from the kernel module when you can put every single instruction and then break the system. So this verification is, uh, how is it doing that you cannot break the, the Linux kernel? Is it running in sandbox? Is it a virtual machine? Or is it just a binary code that can do anything but is verified somehow? How does it work that it cannot break the kernel? Yeah, so <laughs> the verifier is a very complex piece of software. Um, and it's, it could be a whole like presentation and conference on its own. Um, I think like the big thing is, is, is making sure that you're not like so you can't have like unbounded loops um, in there. You, the program has to run to completion. Uh, like there's, uh, it doesn't, um, I guess, like leave any memory, like hang. So it, it does a lot of checks. And I guess that's the role of the verifier. Uh, yeah, okay, I understand. But uh, for example, let's say you have a uh, malicious, uh, malicious eBPF program that is sometimes, only sometimes, based on something doing an endless loop, for example, or something like this. So your validator is not catching this, and then when you return from the system call, for example, something bad happens and you can hang the system. So uh, like, uh, how can you ensure that this is a safe solution? Because this runs in a kernel space. Yeah, so make sure every single, like there are limitations on the complexity of programs to avoid exactly that issue. So the verifier will actually unroll like every single, like, um, uh, uh, like decision for like the whole program and it'll make sure every single one ends. Yeah, and the one final thing. So uh, the, final comp uh, the final code is compiled and this is a native code or is it executed by some in-kernel virtual machine? It's by an in-kernel virtual machine. Okay, that, that, that's all. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Bill, for that presentation. It's uh, simple and to the point. I have a couple of questions for you. So. Can you please touch on some of the use cases that using eBBF is not a good fit? And my second question is to echo his, his, uh, his concern from a, you know, the field. Some many end users are concerned about the security. So is it safe to say, um, it, you know, whatever code we're gonna run based on eBBF would be as safe as the underlying Linux host? Because if the checkers are gonna stop those calls, it has to be built in in the, in the Linux kernel itself. Okay, yeah, so I'll take those one at a time. So the first one is, is there any use cases that eBPF isn't good for? Um, I would say, like, when I was talking about, like, the Linux kernel tech is, like, you know, a decades-old technology. So it's not like people haven't been aware of, like, challenges and limitations, and they haven't tried to build tooling around it, right? The, the kernel has a lot of tooling built in, and there's things that you can already use. So if there's a tool already there, you don't need to write your own programs for it, right? That's, I, I think, like, uh, part of the tweet is, right, like, a lot of these things could be replaced by simple things like shell scripts, right? And so it, if you have, like, a more simple use case, like, you don't need to go to eBPF. Um, a, there's a lot of challenges that are already solved. And it's, I think when you're going to more of these complex use cases, like, Right, so Cilium is built on eBPF because it's trying to 
bring networking into the cloud native world where things are a lot more dynamic, they're a lot more scalable, and so that's where the benefit that eBPF kind of brings where things like traditional things like IP tables wouldn't work, right? And so it really depends like on your use case and what you're trying to do. And so I'd really look at what the use case is. And then on the security aspect, I guess there's a lot, of, sorry, can you repeat that? Because I, there's a lot of different parts of security. Yeah, so in, in the field for you know organizations or team to adopt yeah. eBPF, the, their always first question would be how about the security about this? So I try to kind of educate them this, there is a Linux checker, so the system calls are not just gonna go and run right away, it's gonna go through um, you know, the, the Linux kernel checker. So yep. that is, if something already, you write code or application that's gonna pass that already uh, from a particular security hole in the Linux kernel, it's gonna already pass, it doesn't matter if you have eBBF or not, right? Uh, but that's, that's, those are the type of challenges I see in the field for people pushing back against eBBF. Yeah, I guess on the security aspect, um, I would say like general security advice is like, don't run untrusted code on your machine. Like, don't just <laughs> like let random things. And I, I think the same advice applies to eBPF too. Um, so by default, like, uh, like it, eBPF is like a pri privileged only only privileged um, users can do it. And so, like, you need to have like root or like admin access to be able to load and unload eBPF programs. Um, and if you're loading eBPF programs, right, you're loading something into the kernel, so you should think about what you're loading into the kernel. You shouldn't just be, I, I'm not trying to advocate for just like loading a bunch of eBPF programs and seeing what happens. Like you should know what you're, you're putting into your kernel. Or like a lot of people are relying on higher level applications that they trust, right? So Cilium is doing the loading and unloading of the eBPF programs because it's a, a like application that you trust. And so you should, basically only use EBPF programs that you trust. Yeah. Thank you, that's all. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm a DevOps engineer and I have a lot of work to troubleshooting the uh, host and the containers. And you know, uh, we may uh, have a lot of network issues if we have a 24 by seven high, um, uh, high availability system. So uh, with uh, this is use cases, uh, if we want to troubleshooting and uh, um, what's uh, the programming uh, based on EBPF you will uh, recommend it uh, to me, yeah. Yeah, so I guess it depends on like what you're trying to like troubleshoot, so there's I guess like a bunch of these different like observability um, technologies, like if it's networking, um, like packet where are you is like probably a good place to start because that will trace like all of the packets going through the kernel. Um, if it's other thing, it, uh, like Inspector Gadget allows you to uh, like see what's happening in your application. Um, I guess my recommendation would be like I think most people aren't gonna be writing their own eBPF programs. What they're gonna be doing is leveraging applications that are running eBPF, right? And so, like, I would look for a tool that's using eBPF because it allows you to have kind of like this complete observability to start debugging your issue rather than thinking about like, what's the eBPF program that I can write to solve my issue? Because it's not easy to write eBPF programs, but you're gonna wanna be using the tools and the technologies that leverage eBPF because of the benefits in observability that it will bring and it'll make it easier to troubleshoot, debug, and solve your issue. Okay, thank you. Hi, Bill, thanks. Um, I'm curious, are there maybe some kernel uh, build flags or uh, like kernel config options uh, that might be uh, kind of, th there might be a trade-off uh, or a superior implementation that you could uh, maybe benefit from by you know, maybe turning this off and then implementing that in an eBPF program? Are there examples of that kind of thing? Or just listening to you has me thinking about that. So you're talking about like performance tuning of the Linux kernel? Yeah, I mean it's like, a, it's not easy to write an eBPF program, but it's also like incredibly difficult to like modify the Linux kernel yeah, uh, and I'm kind of wondering if there's 
existing kernel features uh, that have sort of been, I mean, at the high level, right? Like Cilium's like a great example of just like reworking the entire networking stack to publish a bunch of interesting information and map it out to other systems. Um, is it, but like, uh, I'm kind of curious if there's other maybe more trivial uh, things where it's like there was a device flag, but it had a really awkward interface or it didn't work properly. And instead of modifying the Linux kernel, you know, um, they just wrote a device driver in eBPF or something. Yeah. yeah, I mean, there's a lot of interesting use cases like this. Like one example would be like human interface devices. Um, so I know that I think it was like the Microsoft Surface like touchpad. They weren't able to like implement like some of the stuff in the device driver. So they add an eBPF program so that some of the input functionality that was available like on the actual like device, what it could actually be uh, like supported by the Linux kernel, right? And that was an easier way to do it that rather than trying to like rewrite the whole driver. So that that's one way to do it. Yeah. That, that's hilarious and ridiculous, thank you. Yeah, exactly, right. And so, I mean, eBPF is being applied in a lot of different use cases and I, I, yeah, we've seen it a lot of different places um, from like Nix to uh, human interface devices. Um, I would actually, if you wanna dive more into this, uh, Brendan Gregg gave a talk at eBPF Summit, um, one of the keynotes th this past year, and he's um, kind of talking about like performance tuning and how eBPF is enabling to do that. And he's talking about, it's called Fast by Friday, and he kind of like walks through the different things you're gonna wanna think about if you're trying to performance tune an application running on Linux. Okay, uh, if there's no more questions, I guess this is the last session too, so thank you for coming to KubeCon uh, Open Source Summit in China, and. See you maybe in Chicago or anywhere else. Yeah, thank you.